All right, so we are going to go into the next phase of this unit, which is the first stages of imperialism. We had just got done looking in the previous couple of videos. Um, we looked at why things shifted for Japan, why they were motivated to expand and modernize, and it had to do with Perry, which represents the United States, um, and then what internal changes occurred within Japan through the Meiji Restoration. So now we're looking at what external changes are going to occur. So we're going to be looking at the first stages of imperialism, right? So the first stages of expansion. So I'm going to start off with the first Sino-Japanese War. If you don't know what the word Sino means, just in case, um, Sino equals Japanese. So this is a war between Japan and the Chinese. Um, and they have had a very long history of conflict, right? As Japan entered this new age of militarization, one of the first territories they were aiming towards was the Korean Peninsula. So I know today we know Korea as North Korea, South Korea, but before um, the uh, World War II, before the Cold War, all of this, um, the Korean Peninsula was basically together, right? And you can see it right there in the image, just pretend like it's just one blob. Uh, but Japan knew if they went after Korea that China would enter to defend Korea as China had a strong relationship with Korea. Um, because of the relationship with the emperor, right? China's emperor. In 1894, uh, an uprising in Korea uh, made the Korean government ask for China's help in, in, you know, in stopping it. But Japan was like, hmm, let me make this my problem, as in let me use this opportunity to go in there and basically claim this, right? Uh, this led to direct conflict between the Chinese and the Japanese army because you have the Japanese military going into Korea, bumping into China and basically fighting things out, right? Um, this basically put into the question of, all right, now we're going head to head. Who ended up modernizing the best? Who has the best army? Um, who who's gonna who's gonna win this, right? Um, and so basically, whoever ends up winning this first battle would set the tone for who might end up dominating East Asia moving forward, right? So. Japan ends up being the one that dominates. They are, they kick China, they kick their butt. Um, this led to the Treaty of Shimo, sorry, Shimonoseki, which forced China to recognize Korea as independent. This led to the Liandong Peninsula um, and like all these like little regions right here, these islands, um, as you can see on the map, being given to um, to Japan. Japan was also granted commercial and trading rights with China. This victory for Japan was a confirmation that they were superior over China, making them the higher civilization, making them, you know, the one that's going to end up dominating moving forward. This led the population to believe that they were now equal to Western powers. Mind you, this is just one battle against China and China, China's stability at this moment in time is not that strong. Right. So it, it, it kind of makes you like think like, dang, like, yeah, Japan was a little bit full of themselves, but nonetheless, it's still a victory. A victory is a victory. Right. Um, so they believe that they are equal to the Western powers now and their new slogan. They're living up to their new slogan, which is rich country, strong army. This victory led to new tensions as Russia also wanted to control the Korean and uh, Liaodong Peninsula. Um, and the reason for that, and we'll look in a map later, is because if you look at Russia, and this is before Russia became part of the Soviet Union, if you look at Russia, basically they border those regions. They're very close to that, and we're going to see other regions like um, the Manchurian region as well and how all of this come, comes together. Under the pressure, though, by the U.S. and the British, the Japanese government was forced to give up Liandong to Russia, and this showed that Japan was truly not a power yet. Like, they were not a Western, they were not up to par with the United States or the British or just other Western powers. Because why? Because the United States is like, mm, no, no, not so fast, buddy, right? Um, you can see right here, and, and you know, in, in an exam for paper one, you might be asked like the importance of the proximity of Korea. And you can see right here, Korea's right here, Japan's right here. So it would naturally make sense that Japan would try to go for um, the Korean Peninsula. And you can see in this blue area as well, you know, we're, we're going to see Japan trying to expand through there as well. And then eventually we're going to see Japan kind of going through this coast, um, specifically Southern Asia as well. Um, but that is like ahead of where we're at right now. We'll, we'll get to that eventually. Um, so next part of expansion is the Russian uh, Russo-Japanese War. 
and the Anglo-Japanese alliance. So the first out of the outcome of the first Sino-Japanese war upset Russians as they wanted to secure their own interests in Manchuria and Korea. In 1898, tensions between Japan and Russia grew worse uh, when China gave Russia permission to build the South Manchurian Railway. Um, Russia also gained a 20 year lease on Liandong, which made tensions again worse. This seemed to this seemed that the conflict between Russia and Japan would break out in an anticipation of this. Japan signed the Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1902. This alliance made it so that both the British and Japanese would maintain the status quo in that region and both would defend one another if they were attacked. Uh, efforts to negotiate failed. Both sides did not want to recognize the entrance that they had in Manchuria. February 8th, 1904, the Japanese Navy attacked the Russian Pacific Fleet, then officially declared war on February 10th. Um, <clears throat> the war was fought on land and sea. It sunk the Russian fleet and it ended in October 1905. So February 10th, all the way through October 1905 of the same, well, not the same year, but very not 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 a very long war, but here's the thing: the Russians believed, at least the the Tsar believed that, that this was going to be a short war because it's like, oh, we're superior. We got like this military, and who are they? They're just you know Japanese people, right? We're gonna we're gonna win this. So he he labeled this as the splendid little war, and he thought that this little war was going to be the thing that would help him kind of retain power because at this moment in time in Russia there is like an instability and there's like uh, an unrest of people like questioning why all of this is happening, right? As a result of the war under the Treaty of Portsmouth, um, which the US negotiated, Japan acquired South uh, Sakhalin and the lease over Liandong and control over the Manchurian Railway. Russia was also forced to recognize Japan's interest over Korea, which Japan became its protector in 1906, and in 1910, Korea became its colony. This boosted Japan's nationalism because of their imperialistic victories. So basically, yes, we did that. We won. And not only, yes, nobody wanted to kind of take us seriously when we took um, when we took uh, down China, but now we took down somebody who was supposedly, you know, one of the big powerhouses at this time. And we did that. We took that down. We won, right? And so now Japan is feeling very confident in all of this. Um, and if you're wondering, like, why is this railway so important? Just, you know, railway is railways are always going to be important and I need you to understand that um, and and a lot of conflict has occurred throughout history about like acquiring railways and building them and having the right to build them why because you can move so much whether it's people material and that equals money right um, and you can see this railway these these like outlines of the railway so we got Russia right here we got China which is like um, the Manchurian region and we got Korea. So we have these Manchurian railways that connect um, from these ports all the way to inland and so on and so forth. And you, you know, you're stopping through these cities and picking up cargo or moving cargo, trade, all of these things, right? So this railway is extremely important for money, for power, right? Um, and so that's why we have these, like we have Japan and we have China, we have Russia having an interest in these, in this railway and other railways that we'll see later on. Um, but that is it for this one and thank you.